Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, welcome. This is a, an exciting experiment for us. Normally, I'm not at the front of the podium, but I'm GSAP's um, event director. Uh, this is, to my knowledge, our first ever 100% virtual event. All of the presenters who have um, won a prize from the GSEP incubator um, or for the GSEP incubator have um, are going to be presenting remotely. Um, David Benjamin, who will be introducing the program in just a moment, is also presenting remotely, and he'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, I just wanted to welcome you all and uh, thank you for participating in this exper experiment with us. Uh, at GSEP, we've been thinking a lot about um, especially what, uh, what we can do to change um, our own carbon footprint as a school. Um, there's a lot of things that we can improve on, and one of them is events. We purchase a lot of flights. We'll continue for now to purchase a lot of flights, but also we want to sort of figure out how does it work, how does the technology work. You know, sort of this seems to me to be the future of gatherings, um, intellectual um, and otherwise. So I'm really excited about this, and I hope that you'll kind of stick with us. Um, at the end of the presentations, there's going to be a discussion, and so you'll have an opportunity to come up here and look into the camera at what everyone else is seeing, and you'll see it throughout the day as we're um, doing this presentation here. So I'm going to turn it over now to David Benjamin to introduce the program. Thanks for that introduction, Lila. And welcome, everyone, to the GSAP Incubator Prize discussion. Um, just building on what, what Lila has already said, um, as Dean Amal Andreas has stated, at GSAP, climate change is ground zero for a shared discussion about architecture's engagement uh, with the world. Um, but of course, climate change is complex and it's intertwined with things like materials, technologies, economics, politics, society, and culture. Uh, although buildings account for a third of global waste, energy consumption, and carbon emissions, there's no easy single architectural fix to climate change. Action on one register often triggers changes on other registers, sometimes in unintended ways with negative consequences. Uh, for example, you know, just uh, a, a year or two ago, a recent carbon tax in France triggered massive yellow vest protests and an environmental policy without social equity ultimately backfired. Um, so this is just to say that uh, climate change is certainly the territory of science and numbers, but it's also a territory of culture and society. And from this perspective, it's important to look at the whole and at the part at the same time to understand the impact and the magnitude of specific changes and design moves. So while we might think about redesigning buildings and redesigning our approach to materials, we might also think about redesigning ways of life. And, you know, just bringing it around to this event, one could say that this kind of multi-dimensional, multi-scale approach, this design approach, this, you know, basis in addressing a complex problem through design is really the strength of the school. And this brings us to the GSAP Incubator Prize and another strength of the school, which is the school's students and alumni. Um, so the GSAP Incubator Prize, uh, is dedicated uh, this year at least to the topic of climate change at the building scale and the prize offers direct financial support to projects created by gsap alumni that advance environmental concerns in architecture and its related fields and i think you'll see today how it's fitting that the uh, different prize winners from this year are addressing this topic in a variety of ways and in a, in a really uh, kind of rich discussion and exploration of these issues. Um, so today we're very excited to welcome the recipients of the prize back to the school um, in this kind of video conference format to present their work in progress this afternoon and to engage with the Avery community with you in the room uh, in Avery in a kind of uh, back and forth discussion. So as Lila already said, the format of the event is part of the school's experiment in using video conference uh, more for certain discussions at the school. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, ask for your patience if there are any technical issues. Um, so we're kind of trying this out. As Lila said, it's the first time we've done an all video uh, event at the school. 
Um, so the format will be that um, each uh, recipient uh, will give a brief presentation about their work in progress, and then we will move to um, a kind of discussion, including with with everyone in the in the room at Avery. Um, so I will just make th these are basically the end of my remarks. I will just make very brief um, introductions to each presenter right before they present, and we'll we'll move on from there. So. Um, the first uh, presentation will actually be a recorded presentation by Dan Luo. Uh, Dan is based between uh, China and Australia. Her internet connection is not reliable enough to present live uh, today. So she, she will not be joining us for the discussion, but she's prepared this video for us to watch. Um, Dan investigates issues caused by massive migration of rural populations to urban areas in China. And her project is designed to engage the regrowth of nature in abandoned rural villages. She received her MARC from GSAP in 2014, and she is a doctoral candidate in engineering with a focus on digital architectural design and fabrication at Tsinghua University, Beijing. And I think with that, um, we will be able to launch the video presentation. Hi, greeting everyone, and hello all the alumnus of GSAP and all the guests here. Thank you all for being here today. Hello, Professor David Benjamin. Thank you for hosting the event. My name is Dan Lu. I graduated from MR program in GSAP in 2014. I just started as a lecturer in University of Queensland, Australia last year. I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to the GSAP Incubator Prize and all the dedicated committee members. Thank you everyone for making all the wonderful project happen. I'm one of the recipients of the 2019 to 2020 GSAP Incubator Prize. It is my honor today to give everyone an update on the current progress of the project. Thank you. So the project is titled Baby for Nature. That's the current title right now. The intent of the project is to develop a fast and easily deployable large-scale spatial framework to creatively engage with the growth of nature in abandoned or informal green spaces in village and suburban sites. Such processes are not viewed as a retreat from the built space, but rather as a dynamic interplay between creative agency and the natural world. Using the large-scale woven structure, we will create a framework to facilitate the growth of plants and convert the abandoned place to a place of vibrance and life. So the project is inspired by the current trend where villages and suburban towns are being at the front line of being impacted by the social economical changes, rapid developments, as well as the migration of population. With the rise and fall of local industries and social populations, patches of abandoned or underdeveloped lands emerges here and there in those kind of suburban or village areas. Typically, these areas are viewed as the scarce or being neglected part of the city, so that the local people and the government often feel propelled to redevelop the site in the rush hide it behind the walls, or even just pave it with hardened concrete for easier maintenance. However, those some of spaces left over by man to evolution of nature alone can be viewed as an interim of development between urban or rural sites. Those unattended areas, compared to the territories submitted to the control and the exploration by man, those leftover land were actually privileged areas for natural and biodiversity purposes. In fact, those unattended neighborhood spaces provide a higher diversity of spaces, even comparing to the cultivated land and the managed forests. So collectively, the project will start with an investigation into the technique of traditional weaving method. With a few material experiments, the logic of weaving is translated into a digital workflow that enables the design and assembly of large-scale free-form weaving structure. With the large-scale spatial weaving as a method of intervention, we also put together an assortation of plantations to grow within the framework for a few typical sites in China and Australia. With the project, 
we intended to change the public perception of those areas from abandoned land to a site of potential creativities that engages human and nature. So this is the algorithm we have developed that allows the calculation of a systematic spatial weighting method for any freeform geometries, allowing the potential freedom for creative artistic expressions that could be realized for, with a uniform method of spatial weaving. So all we need to provide is the assembly manual for pre-calculated geometries, and everyone can do it in their backyard or in their own villages. So small-scale studies are the first step to systematically develop free-form spatial weaving method that allow for the rapid deployment of a spatial framework. Here are a few examples of smaller prototypes that we have developed using the Vimy method and algorithm. However, translating into a large scale still remains a cha uh, challenge. At this point, we started to investigate into bending active decomposable natural materials that are accessible at low cost, which would be made available to most of the villages or suburban areas that we're investigating into. A few studies and simulations has been conducted to expand the system into large scale. So naturally, we looked into bamboo as an option, as it is traditionally used in smaller scale weaving of different artifacts, as well it has been a common material that is used to build large temporal structures in rural sites. So last December, we conducted our first large scale spatial weaving experiment with bamboo with the help of bamboo weaving experts, starting from harvesting raw bamboo, we use traditional bamboo splitting and processing method to prepare the linear bending active material strip for our further experiment. Though a more uniform synthetic material such as polycarbonate pipes is more commonly used as a weaving structure, which is far more easier to calculate, However, treatment calculation and the connection of bamboo is a lot more difficult owing to its uneven natural properties. Thus, we looked into traditional bamboo processing and weaving techniques, as well as modern bamboo installations, to develop a method that could, the, so that the structure could be quickly assembled in a rapid and low-cost manner. We tested our findings with the weaving of a 3 meter high partial sphere, pro proving the feasibilities and the structural validities of the entire design build system. So here is the time lapse movie that shows the process of the weaving of our latest bamboo weaving experiment. The entire semi sphere is assembled and weaved in five hours. The next experiment and the next step is to further expand this system and explore how it would perform with larger and more freeform weaving in response to design intentions and the local conditions on the site. So parallel to the technical development of and the material experiments for weaving and assembly system, for the most of the first half of 2020, we're planning on looking into the plantation and the vegetation of those abandoned areas in suburban and village sites. Though we first started with the investigation into the climate and the vegetation condition of a few typical areas in China that suffers the most from losing and the migration of its population, which was the original intention of this project. However, as everyone probably have heard about the unprecedented bushfire which was currently ongoing in Australia near where I live and I work, we're planning on adding a few sites in Australia as well, which we feel could also benefit from our intervention as an enhanced on recovering from uh, post-disaster like bushfire and adding the biodiversity of nature. So the intent of this part of research is to propose an assortation of vegetations for each of the selected sites that would both work as the artistic interplay with our framework as well as enhance the recovering ability and the biodiversity of the local natural systems. 
Ideally, in the short future, we will make an assembly and plantation menu for each of those sites, as well as a future forecast of how the system will develop with natural growth in one to three years' time, so that the local or local communities could easily refer to the menu and deploy the system of spatial waving and plantation selections to the abandoned or post-disaster sites in their own neighborhood, transforming it with an artistic or creative engagement while enhancing the local ecosystem and biodiversity. In last December, we have already conducted a full-scale experiment of spatial waving for just the partial sphere forms. So in addition to the research menu that we are to produce in the short future, toward mid-2020, we have selected and have agreement with a few sites that we are planning to build our full-scale deployment with plantation as a sample project to demonstrate the potential of the system and observe how it will facilitate with the growth of the nature while provoking positively so, uh, positive social attentions to those leftover areas that used to be ignored. Lastly, this project wouldn't happen without this wonderful team of experts from field of digital design, spatial weaving, bamboo crafting, and the landscape together. This is a diverse team that brings together talents across different countries to discuss how do we contribute to prevent climate change and enhance biodiversity with a new touch on traditional craftsmen and a new perspective of digital design, combining the architecture and the landscapes. This is the report of the current progress of the project. Thank you all, the friend of GSEP, for supporting the project. And thank you, Alumina Prize, for making it all happen. I apologize that I couldn't make it here live today, but feel free to contact me if you are interested in this project in any way. Thank you, and see you around. So we're going to keep going through the presentations, and the next presentation will be by the next uh, GSEP Incubator Prize winner, Greta Hansen. Greta has been exploring the potential of hempcrete as an ecological alternative to concrete at an urban scale. She's working to understand the manufacturing processes and also the municipal and building restrictions. And she is eventually aiming to create a prototype building with hempcrete. Greta received her MARC from GSAP in 2009 and was an incubator member in 2018-19. Greta. Um, hi, uh, thank you so much, David. Um, I am Greta Hansen, and I'm sitting here with McMeehan. Um, we're incredibly honored to have the opportunity from Columbia University to look at a new material that could change the way we build our cities. And I'm going to just switch to a shared screen. Okay. Is that working, I hope? Um, so, as David said, I graduated from Columbia in 2009 and started a design field, uh, firm with my partner, Sean Rofi, a few years back. Nick, next to me, has been working with us for the last year on various architecture and interiors projects. One of our projects is a medical marijuana dispensary with a new facade. Um, our clients wanted the image of the building to speak to their products, so we proposed a facade made of hemp. Um, we also proposed a hempcrete interior, and we quickly realized that hempcrete is far too new a product in urban municipality to be approved easily by building departments. So we started to wonder, what does it actually take to bring a new and environmental material to standard building practice? Hempcrete isn't a material in our standard architectural toolkit. And because of that, we're gonna go on a bit of walk through history in order to get to our proposal, which ultimately questions what materials have been left out of the architectural imagination that could radically transform our approach to building? Has modernism's vilification of vernacular craft in general blindsided us to essential carbon negative building traditions? And how do we take plant-based building materials and scale them up for urban production? Um, hempcrete is possibly the most viable carbon negative building material, um, and we want to investigate how we can bring it to cities. 
So first, hemp the plant. It is cannabis. It's a strain that has a lower THC than marijuana. It's a plant that grows in almost every climate on Earth and grows so fast that it can be harvested twice per year in some areas. It needs less irrigation than most crops, requires no chemical pesticides. It's naturally pest resistant and produces a huge amount of biomass. So that's why it's carbon negative. Um, industrial hemp's biomass sequesters more CO2 than any other forest or commercial crop per acre, 15 tons of CO2 per year. If it were planted on every square kilometer of arable land just for livestock feed production alone, its carbon sequestration would roughly negate our total global annual CO2 emissions. So perhaps carbon offsetting companies should consider growing wheat. Compare that to the construction industry, which contributes 39% of global CO2 emissions. That statistic is 70% in New York City, a third of which comes from the embodied energy of construction materials. And concrete is the most consumed single substance on earth and makes, us eight, makes up 8% of global CO2 emissions. Hempcrete could be a partial substitute. It's made from the dried stock of the industrial fiber hemp plant as a bioaggregate and a lime-based binder. Hempcrete, like the hemp plant, has a number of positive attributes. In addition to being carbon negative, it's lightweight, it's biodegradable, it's naturally pest resistant, water resistant, fire resistant. It is structurally self-supporting. It's hygroscopic, which means that it breathes. It's reusable. You can literally break it down, mix it with new line and reform it. And it's an excellent insulator. So in some form, it's been around for thousands of years. Uh, since the Ellora Buddhist caves in India, where hemp and lime produces a plaster 1,500 years ago on the right. And it was also used to caulk the bottom of ancient Chinese junk ships, as well as these ancient Fred French bridge supports on the left. So hemp can be grouped with other bio-based building siblings. The hemp in hempcrete is one of many bioaggregates or plant-based aggregates for construction, and can be grouped along earth and plant-based materials like cob, which is a mud reinforced with fibers, straw hail, a tabby, which is oyster shells and lime, as well as experiments with mycelium, lufa, or sunflower. Whether historical or new, we see these materials as proto-architectural. These materials were standards in building before the Industrial Revolution, which not coincidentally appears in history just as the formal profession of architecture is being formed. The AAA was officially founded in 1857, just as steel and concrete were replacing a lot of these other construction methods. And the ideology behind architectural detailing was born out of the inventions of the Industrial Revolution. So what was left behind and what the emerging profession of architecture separated from were builder traditions, including building with plant-based materials. There are some caveats like wood framing, but by and large, plant-based building traditions were abandoned by architects. So it is no surprise that hempcrete was discovered or um, kind of rediscovered, not by an architect or an engineer, but by a restorer in France named Charles Rossetti, who was working on a plant-based building from the 16th century made of wattle and dog construction. Um, most plant-based buildings are very hygroscopic. That means in essence that they're breathable, even if they're airtight because water vapor passes through the wall assembly and back out. So restorations experts uh, were increasingly noting in the 20th century that newer gypsum and Portland cement-based materials were trapping moisture on the inside of historic wall constructions and damaging sometimes um, the wood structure within. Um, so while Rossetti was working on this building, the Maison de la Turc, um, uh, he, he worked to avoid this by mixing a hemp paste infill material to apply it to the existing walls. And this is actually where cannabis legality comes in. France is the only Western European country never to have outlawed industrial hemp production in the 20th century. So the fact that there was a thriving hemp industry made it a valid material to experiment. And in fact, there was a hemp farmers cooperative in the region of this building. Um, and that cooperative in turn turned into a company which began to patent formations of hempcrete blocks as restorers around France took after Rossetti's example. Um, from these restorations, variations on hempcrete were patented in France and um, spread to the UK, um, influencing builders. Most hempcrete has been um, 
with in residential applications by green developers, green construction companies, and self builders, also a handful of architects. Um, there are hempcrete homes throughout Europe, one in Israel, there's roughly 50 in the United States now. Um, there are very few examples of commercial hempcrete buildings. Um, our search has been so exhaustive that it has led us to a storage facility in uh, suburban Canada and a Marks and Spencer store in the UK. Um, we've found fewer examples of hempcrete in cities, but there are a few examples in Paris of uh, low-rise hempcrete residences. You may not have seen hempcrete in the US, uh, but if you've been walking in any US city in the last year, you have likely seen these. Um, and they've popped up incredibly quickly. While industrial hemp was being legalized in many European countries in the 90s, it took the United States until the very end of 2000 and 18 to legalize it federally with the Farm Bill. Um, and so because of that, hemp has, industrial hemp has federally only had one legal growing season in the United States since 1937. Um, the CBD example illustrates what kind of economic and policy mobilization is possible when there is enough perceived demand for a product. Um, it's clear from what's going on um, in residences, um, starting um, in the US, that it is possible to grow your own home. And we think that the experimentation that's happened so far with concrete brings us much closer to growing our own cities, and in this case, New York. Um, there are certainly obstacles, including the fact that New York City building codes don't account for many plant-based materials. Um, and we think that the interest of architects is really essential to advocating for plant-based cities. Um, and we want to compare briefly um, a typical wall versus a typical, uh, a typical exterior wall versus a typical hempcrete wall. Um, a typical wall achieves its performance through a variety of materials, obviously, separately holding itself up, insulating thermally, shedding water, providing fire resistance. Hempcrete does this with one material, and you see here that with an eight inch thickness, um, it insulates with some proportion to a typical wall. Um, however, to achieve passive house standards, a hempcrete wall would need to be about 16 inches in order to insulate properly. Um, and um, that, also, um, that also is the thickness at which a hempcrete wall would need to, would, would need to be to achieve a two hour fire rating. Um, you, you can add to this with additional lime as a plaster or other cladding materials. Um, but New York City comes with a zoning ordinance which makes a thicker wall feasible in terms of real estate, allowing um, up to eight inches worth of deductions from um, calculations of floor area, in fact. Um, our estimates, by the way, on fire ratings come not from US standards, but from testing done on hemp blocks in France and the UK um, a next step in the U.S. is to work um, towards nationalized U.S. Uh, materials testing, um, beginning to test hempcrete. Uh, that's something that hempcrete suppliers are quite wary to do uh, because of liability. But we've just begun to reach out to some engineers who may be willing to work with us on initial flame tests of the material. So these are some hempcrete blocks we actually ordered as samples from a company in Canada where industrial hemp has been legal since 1998. This is a quick test we made with finishing one of those samples out of the plaster infill. And these are some of our first small block tests which we made while we were waiting for a larger order of hemp shift to arrive. And because industrial hemp cultivation is so new to the United States, it's still very difficult to source locally. So here's a picture of about 50 pounds of hemp shiv and about 65 pounds of hemp uh, lime binder, which will be the source of our continued block experiments. The opportunity to create hempcrete blocks for the purpose of an exhibit allows us to test the possibilities of the material and to question what the future of a New York City exterior wall can be. Uh, working within some of the given parameters to hemp construction, such as the 16 inch deep block. We're kind of looking now to mine the properties of hempcrete for the intersections between its performance and aesthetics, whether that's in its adaptability to reuse mold forms, in its ability to breathe and clean the air, or even in its texture and potential to create a new 
urban palette. So these are a few sketches of an exhibition proposal at GSAP. And today we're really um, open to hearing thoughts and questions about how our first time construction can help us get to the root of our initial question, which is what does it actually take to grow your own city? Thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot. Um, so our next presenter is Eugenia Malwalen. Uh, she is working on a project called Inter Institute which reimagines a historic building located in the rural Catskills region of New York, where she and her colleagues are using community-engaged architectural design processes. Eugenia received her Master's of Urban Planning from GSAP in 2011. Welcome, Eugenia. This is what my background is in um, planning. I'm a planning practitioner and um, an artist in choreography and theater so for me this digital i'm leaning into it but it is um a little wacky to be so disembodied um but i'm gonna do my best um so thank you so much for hosting this event and it's been such an honor and pleasure to hear about other people's projects and i think um to see some really obvious connections between them like you know, I work, I live in the Sullivan County Catskills and I'm working, just drafted a sustainable construction policy for our land bank that includes hempcrete as one of the materials, as one of our preferred materials. So it's really nice and um, and exciting to see to see it pop up here as well. And, and not surprising, I suppose. Um, I want to acknowledge my collaborators who are not here with me today, Tal Beery and Danica Selim, both artists and um, architects who I'm working closely with on this project. And um, and I'll and I'll say that you know the 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 concept behind this project is in part about um, what happens when you bring together people from disparate practices and disparate fields um, in the same program and in the same space, um, you know, what are, what, are the, what are the benefits of that sort of um, cultural practice? And I think this, um, you know, this prize is a good example of, of that as well. Um, so I want to say a few things about resilience. I have taught a few um, courses at GSAP since I've graduated. Um, I believe all of which were actually focused on resilience and um, and and resilience is, you know, a powerful and necessary lens through which to look at architecture and planning. And I think we are living in the sort of anxiety provoking period of economic and social and ecological uncertainty and you know we're faced with this I think we're called upon to sort of reorient our relationship with natural resources and with one another I think this effort is in my hope sort of coming to define our generation and it's in that spirit that um that I'll be talking about inter-institute and and what it is. Um, so it is conceived of as a multidisciplinary center for art and ecology located in the rural and wild Catskill Mountains of upstate New York. Um, it offers indoor and outdoor contemporary art exhibitions, educational programs for all for people of all ages, intensive workshops for adults, frequent public events, um, and it is about two hours from New York City and about two hours from Albany. Um, it is sited in the Delaware River watershed, which comprises, you know, a significant portion of your water that you're drinking today and part of the largest unfiltered drinking water system in the world. And the site that we are currently looking at is um, a 400 acre um, campus uh, the building is a former ski chalet, sort of as reimagined as an inclusive and experimental haven for artists, scientists, architects, 
educators in the local community to come together and um, chart out and unearth paths towards what we like to call futures worth living. So among our guiding principles is the importance of rural and wild landscapes. And I know this is GSEV and I know I graduated with a degree in urban planning, but um, I'm currently most interested in rural and wild landscapes. It, it, it accounts for, depending on who you ask and where you look, uh, upwards of 97% of the land in the United States. And because our rural communities are so often tasked disproportionately tasked with the stewardship of our most vital natural resources. I think it's so important to invest in their cultural and ecological and economic well-being. Um, and a little bit about Sullivan County. Um, it is the only rural county in downstate New York with about 75,000 year-round residents. Um, and um, there are portions of Sullivan County that are owned by New York City and protected um, by the DEC as part of the Catskill Delaware watershed. It is a wonderful county. <laughs> it is um, incredibly ethnically and linguistically diverse. Um, it, it also suffers from half a century of disinvestment and um, according to County Health Rankings report, it has the second poorest health outcomes among all New York counties, followed only by the Bronx. Um, and it's also a county that's experiencing the fastest percent cumulative population growth in the region. Um, I, I think I'm going to assume that we all more or less know and um, agree on um, the uh, realities and impacts and future impacts of climate change. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll gloss over that. But since 1950, spring in New York State has come a week earlier, average temperatures have risen by two and a half, about two and a half degrees. And obviously, this has had large effects already and will continue to have effects. So um, in light of this, climate change at the building scale is sort of exactly the framework within which Inter-Institute is imagined and situated. We see, you know, the educational workshops, the public exhibitions and the building on site and the site itself as unified within a single cohesive model such that the institutional and physical structures operate in harmony with the organizational mission and programming, which is just kind of a wordy way of saying that the institutional structure reflects um, the ethics and the programming of the organization. Um, and so, so that, you know, land-based art interventions and prefigurative works that address ecological challenges would be, and frankly always ought to be, housed in a building and on a site with an institutional, um, within an institution that reflects the values of resiliency and sustainability and interdependence. Um, I guess just the opposite of greenwashing, essentially. Um, and so if we're to sort of reinforce those ethics of resilience and sustainability and interdependence, um, it seems like there's no sort of better institution suited to the task than a cultural institution. and. Um, uh, for instance, national public opinion polling consistently shows that Americans overwhelmingly appreciate and recognize the value of cultural institutions, although there is, as you may have noticed nationally, a decline um, in trust in public institutions in the United States, but sort of across the board, um, young, old, conservative, liberal, Americans seem to trust their cultural institutions. And according to the American Alliance for Museums, there are about 850 million visits each year to American museums, which is more than the attendance for all major league sporting events and theme parks combined. Um, so I think museums have a, um, sorry, I should have been there, um, have a incredibly significant role to play and, um, you know, nevertheless, you know, despite the fact that museums are these 
powerful and trusted institutions, public funding for the arts has, um, as you also may have noticed, been diminishing in recent years and um, arts organizations struggle to find private funding. Um, and I think this also speaks to um, one of the crises of uh, where you reach for funding. So, you know, are you, are you as a museum taking money from pharmaceutical companies um, and oil companies that have you know, problematic practices that go against your mission? If you don't have an alternative, then, um, then your, your hands are a bit tied. So the, um, I think these funding dynamics are really worrisome and ultimately an over-reliance on um, short-term contributions from private philanthropists can undermine the long-term resilience of a project. So um, we have programmatically and institutionally sort of conceived of this hybrid funding model that can draw on financial support for uh, social service programs, such as after school programs, programs for the aging, um, nutrition and public health programs, which tend to be um, much larger sums um, given out over much longer periods of time, more predictable, and um, creating an institute that uses those funds alongside more conventional funding sources um, for arts organizations. And where are we? Yep. Um, and I think this cohesion between the principles of the, the principles program and the built environment um, has had a really significant impact on our site selection when we applied for this grant. We applied with um, a site in Mountaindale um, with the owner who was demonstrating kind of tremendous support for the project and had invested in the town. Um, and there was a lot to love about the space. And as we sort of moved forward with our feasibility studies and community engagement process, um, we came to understand that this site uh, would be great for our programming. Um, but um, the owner was more interested in the aesthetics of arts and ecology rather than the development of an institution whose, you know, democratic and ecological values were deeply reflected. And I think that um, as with all of these projects and all of this work, I think there is, um, there is a danger of um, just playing to like the uh, aesthetics of sustainability rather than sustainability itself. And um, I think we came to learn, you know, that this, that this landlord was a great supporter of fracking. And we felt like our institution was just being instrumentalized for a certain um, gentrification based uh, stream of economic development. So we were, both disappointed and grateful that our community engaged design process, you know, equipped us with um, the understanding that this that this site wouldn't work. And in ending our relationship with one site, um, we began. We were approached by an owner of another site in um, in the hamlet of Narrowsburg, who owns um, a mountain, essentially um, half a mile from the Delaware River. And it was we started kind of developing this partnership, um, we were so much better equipped with, um, with the right questions from the get go. And um, at this stage, it does appear that this particular owner is mission aligned, understands what we're trying to accomplish, um, and is open to kind of a different development model. We're also um, excited at the opportunity to work in Narrowsburg, which is um, which is already home to a number of important like local arts institutions and to work on a site that is much more ecologically significant um, next to an incredibly ecologically significant um, site, probably one of the most in the Northeast, which is um, the Delaware River. Uh, we've had a few kind of um, architectural inspirations that continue to guide our community engaged design process. Um, we're looking at um, renovation, adaptation, and reuse. Um, this is uh, the SESC Pompeia in uh, Sao Paulo, um, which is the sort of um, where uh, it is like a deeply intergenerational 
space, which was part, very much part of its design. Um, we think about the landscape as a stakeholder rather than just a site or a context for the work. Um, and this is, um, this is um, Lacaton and Vassal's house in Cape Ferret in France. And also, um, if you don't know Enetzing's book, The Mushroom at the End of the World, you should read it. It is wonderful. Um, and um, in considering human and non-human architectures, um, uh, where when you do your stakeholder analysis, you look at non-human stakeholders as well. Uh, so to wrap up, kind of what have we learned so far, uh, kind of halfway through this process, um, I think we learned a lot about how to articulate our core principles and um, the elements of construction and design and programming that are essential to the success and integrity of our project. And we've experienced the, um, what I would say are the benefits of an open-ended community engaged architectural design process that doesn't always lead you um, to the answers that you're hoping for. And I think when we're being honest and we're not just trying to back up into, like we haven't made our decisions and just trying to back up into them, that we're, we are kind of genuinely open, um, that, um, that I think that there's really valuable there's a lot of value in that even though it's 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 um it's a tough lessons to learn um and our next steps as we move forward are continuing with our community engaged design process um with the ultimate goal at the end of this particular grant cycle to have a draft integrated architectural and programmatic design um with the aim of connecting with multiple partners and essentially moving from um people's uh, people's like programmatic desires and needs in spatializing yes essentially spatializing um the needs and um the needs of the local and regional community great thank you um our next presenter is adam marcus Adam is an associate professor of architecture at the Columbia College of the Arts in San Francisco, where he is co-director of the Architectural Ecologies Lab. The lab studies ecologically productive floating structures as a form of sea level rise adaptation. Adam received his MRC from GSAP in 2005. Welcome, Adam. Thanks, David. Can, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> Good. Um, it's great to be here. Um, thanks for the introduction and thanks to the school for supporting this project and all these projects. It's amazing to be um, to share this event with such kind of inspiring and impactful projects. Um, I'm going to share my screen real fast. Um, all right. Hopefully you can all see that. Yeah. yeah um, so um, as David mentioned, I teach at California College of the Arts in San Francisco, um, and I direct a research group called the Architectural Ecologies Lab, um, along with two colleagues, Margaret Aketa and Evan Jones, who are, are kind of full partners in the project I'm going to show today. Um, the lab serves as a platform for collaborative research uh, between designers, scientists, and manufacturers. Um, and specifically, we're interested in exploring the intersection of architecture, material innovation, and ecological performance. Um, thinking of ways we can leverage interdisciplinary expertise and meaningful collaborations with scientists specifically um, to develop compelling architectural, uh, uh, architectural strategies to address ecological challenges like sea level rise, habitat restoration, and climate change. Um, I'm, today I'm going to talk about um, the focus of this this grant um, and one of our primary initiatives, which is a project, um, an ongoing project called Point Ecologies, and specifically our latest prototype, um, which we call the Float Lab. Um, it's a pilot project for an ecologically productive floating architecture. Um, and I'm going to start with some background on the project, which was started um, 2014, 2015, so it's been going on for a while. Um, and then I'm going to um, uh, conclude with some recent images and talk about the work we've been doing um, this year. Um, central to the project is the notion of material performance at an ecosystemic scale. 
Um, when we think about um, resilience, we often think about, um, uh, oftentimes uh, architects and planners think of kind of large scale infrastructural changes at the kind of macro scale that can, that, that, that can you know, increase um, uh, adaptability and resilience. Um, our work tries to kind of invert that um, and instead think about how material strategies at the micro scale can have broader and transformative impact at the scale of an entire ecosystem. Um, and related to this, many of our, much of our work uh, seeks to leverage computational design, digital fabrication to try to develop new material strategies that can, that can have these effects. Um, the project, the Boyne Ecologies Project is a collaborative research um, endeavor. Um, that synthesizes not just architectural design, but also marine ecology, material innovation, um, as well as community engagement and regula regulatory advocacy um, to develop uh, new approaches to constructing resilient waterfront structures. Um, and these are our, the kind of primary partners, our group at CCA, um, the Architectural Ecologies Lab, um, as well as a team of marine ecologists at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, which is a big research um, facility in Monterey Bay. Um, Chrysler and Associates, which is a global kind of leader in, in composites manufacturing at the architectural scale. Um, and also the Port of Oakland, um, who's been a cr critical partner providing the deployment site as well as um, logistical support, um, for putting things in the water. Um, the ecological premise of the project challenges uh, conventional notions of, of what's called fouling or biofouling, um, which is the unwanted uh, accumulation of marine life on the underside of, of floating structures. Uh, traditionally, species that attach to themselves to the holes of floating structures are called fouling communities because they create resistance in the water um, when, when boats move. Um, and this is often seen as a nuisance. If, and if you're a boat owner, um, you know that you have to kind of regularly scrape off these barnacles and other animals every year. Um, this project um, seeks to turn biofouling into an asset. Um, and so instead proposing that controlled upside down growth um, of these animals can actually become an ecological resource. And, and really the way the project has developed a focus on kind of two, um, two benefits. One is that um, instead of flat, uh, surfaces that create kind of homogeneous um, habitats that are dominated by whatever the most invasive species is. Um, the thought is that uh, by creating contoured surfaces, you can you can increase the range of species and therefore the the biodiversity um, of the environment. Um, but but as the project developed and the prototypes um, you know started to um, perform um, quite well. Uh, we also realize that these dense masses of invertebrates of animals um, can become can absorb wave energy, um, and and that led us to into this kind of realm of thinking about breakwaters and wave attenuation, um, which of course is critical for um, mitigating erosion control along shorelines and um, an important part of, of thinking about resilience at a larger scale. Um, but so essentially, the project tries to align the interests of kind of um, marine invertebrates of non-human people um, with a kind of human impulse um, for defensive um, adaptation uh, to climate change and sea level, trying to align those two things. Um, the project has developed over um, the past five years um, in a speculative way through a number of studios that um, my colleagues and I have taught at CCA. You see some of that work here. Um, this, this work has been very important to kind of push the the, the kind of speculative limits um, on the part of our ecologist partners to think about the underside of structures as, um, as, a, as a kind of additional facade for a building. Um, and the material focus is, um, has been uh, fiber reinforced polymer composites, commonly known as fiberglass, um, working with Chrysler um, who have capabilities to mill robotic molds and easily customize this material. It's, 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 it's commonly used for boats and marine structures. It's corrosion resistant and very durable, very strong, um, especially when curved. Um, so it, we've developed a series of workflow of kind of prototyping um, these small surface samples, um, so trying to quantify parameters um, of slope and dimension, um, things like that, um, fabricating them um, and um, here you see a selection of some of the early prototypes. Um, these are about 60 centimeters square um, that are 
you know, these strange geometries that are um, designed, kind of um, uh, coordinated or designed, let's say, by our, our ecologists um, and the, translating their sketches into um, forms that, um, that they initially through intuition think would have um, different effects for different types of species. Um, these have been installed underwater and monitored over the past few years um, in successive rounds. Um, and here you see some documentation of that um, through, through diving underwater. Um, and over a few rounds of this, we kind of reached a, point, a kind of proof of concept point where we, we were able to understand that gradation of geometry um, can create gradated habitats. And so you see this here in the kind of before and after um, of the same plate where the different colors on the right are actually different species of invertebrates. Um, these are all animals. Um, uh, a lot of people ask if, if plants, if any of these are plants, um, but plants can't grow upside down because there's no light, no sunlight. Um, so you can see that there are different animals at the peaks and the valleys. Um, so that was very exciting to start to understand that there's a correlation between geometry um, and habitat. Um, re more recent prototypes have looked at uh, these kind of vertically extended uh, uh, tubes, um, thinking about um, how, how to develop the wave attenuation capacity that I mentioned before. And so this is also before and after, and you see on the right, that these kind of huge densities of what, what we call wave attenuating sponges um, start to emerge. Um, and this is in Oakland, um, Oakland Harbor. Um, so all of this kind of led into the construction of the most recent prototype, which, which uh, we call the float lab. Um, here you can see a picture of it completed before um, it was deployed in the water. Um, and as always, we, we look to many precedents, um, including also referenced earlier, the scape, um, the scape work in New York Harbor, um, which is an important touchstone for this work um, and in terms of, of kind of aligning um, non-human interests and human interests, um, but also Bugminster Fuller, who, was, who patented in the 70s um, two ideas for floating breakwaters that were never tested, um, although we suspect they would be compromised by biofouling. Um, and the float lab itself um, essentially is bean-shaped. It's about the size of a car. It's kind of uh, like a clamshell made of two identical parts that are, are um, adhered together. Um, and it's designed as a singular object, but as you can see on the right, it's also um, embedded within it is this idea that there could be multiples um, and that they could string together to create a chain of, of breakwaters and habitats. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the fabrication process of this, but it was designed with a reusable mold, um, thinking about some a form of economy of scale um, so that we could make multiples um, for different sites, et cetera. Um, and here are some shots of, of the fabrication process. This was about two years ago. Um, the cross section, you can see, you know, there's, um, it's basically a, a small sailboat without a mast. It has bilge pumps, a solar panel, um, a small irrigation system for the top side. Um, and again, here are some pictures of the completed prototype and a detail of the surface. Um, I'm uh, not going to spend too much time on this aspect of the project. It's kind of a whole separate sub project, but in many ways, these documents are uh, uh, maybe the most important part of important accomplishments so far. Um, it's actually illegal to, to deploy floating buildings or floating structures in San Francisco Bay. Um, and it, through a year and a half long process, uh, we were able to get permits from both the state governing agency um, and also the federal um, army corps of engineers um, and and to our knowledge you know this is the first um, project of this kind to be approved for deployment in, in uh, san francisco bay um, the site is located within the port of oakland um, on the east side of the bay um, but pretty close to the bay bridge um, and uh, we worked with the port for about a year to kind of figure out all the logistics um, and location etc um, and last this past fall, we deployed Float Lab, um, which um, was an exciting day for us. It was very easy for the port to, <laughs> they're used to dealing with large ships. Um, so it went very smoothly. Um, it was towed into place um, out in the middle of the harbor 
um, where it where it has a great view of the city and the bridge um, and the bay. Um, and you can see some shots here. I'm gonna flip through. Um, this was a video taken um, uh, right after we attached it to the moorings, and um, a, a big swell came in. Excited to see that um, how it kind of took the waves um, without any problems at all. Um, so the the float lab's been deployed now um, for about four months, three or four months. Um, and these are some photos from last week when we visited via boat. Um, you can see that the top the top side has been uh, is uh, loved by the birds as a perch for feeding, um, which is exciting for us. And this kind of um, tidal habitat is developing on the top side, um, which is something we hadn't tested before. On the right um, is an underwater image of the underside, which we're really excited to see is completely covered um, with animals, um, many different types of animals, which was the hope. Um, and now with the support of this grant, we're moving on to the next phase. Um, which is really, um, now that the project is, is deployed, um, we can use it to keep developing experiments into the material research, which is the key, the, the key part of the project. And so we're, we've developed this system, which we call the ecological habitat columns, um, which are basically like underwater chandeliers of modular system that can be switched in and out to test um, these, these columns made out of different materials. Um, and we're continuing the polymer research, but we're also in, very interested in testing other materials, especially um, more um, e ecologically friendly materials, such as this 3D printed calcium carbonate, which is on the, you see some examples of that on the right. Um, so these, these columns uh, were actually to, uh, put together in the past month and deployed last week um, underneath the float lab. Um, these are some shots of that. Um, and they're out there now um, for about, we'll probably leave them out there for about four to six months um, where they'll be monitored by our divers. Um, and parallel to this, um, we're also working on kind of computational uh, simulations that start to imagine not only how the singular float lab or floating breakwater would perform, um, but how multiples could perform. Um, and so this is going to be a big part of the research moving forward, looking at um, again, returning to this idea of material performance um, at, at a singular scale, thinking about a cluster, but then also imagining what, what and, and simulating what a chain of, of ecologically productive floating great waters, um, how that might um, in, enhance the, uh, or, or prevent, help, help mitigate coastal erosion along the shoreline. Um, and of course, we're always thinking architecturally of what could a larger version of this look like um, and potentially um, even at a kind of urban or community scale um, of these floating communities that align human interests with um, broader ecological interests. So with that, um, this is our kind of large team of students and collaborators. Um, and um, again, feel free to reach out um, with any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Um, our next presenter is Stephen Mueller. His irradiated shade project endeavors to develop and calibrate a means of uncovering, representing, and designing for the unseen dangers of irradiated shade, which is where the body is exposed to harmful ambient or scattered UVB radiation, even in what is apparent shade. The research is located at the El Paso Ciudad Juarez Metroplex where the effects of solar radiation are an index of social inequality at the border zone. He received his uh, degree from the AAD program uh, from GSAP in 2006. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, everybody can hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, great. OK, um, well, thank you, David, for the uh, introduction. And thank you to GSAP. Uh, for the prize. I'm really happy to, to meet everybody virtually, meet my co-conspirators, share some ideas. Uh, OK. Um, yeah, as David mentioned, so the, the project is located in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. It's a, it's a binational metroplex sort of bisected by the international boundary between US and Mexico, but really one, one city and one desert city. And it's a city that um, is uniquely subjected to environmental pressures that, that routinely kind of bridge this 
uh, international divide. So pressures from migration, which we've seen in the past few months, uh, including climate migration uh, of populations moving north into the U.S., but also desertification and urbanization. Um, and it's a metropolis that's that's truly underserved uh, by shade and public shade, and it's under underprepared to protect against the dangers of UVB, um, uh, ultraviolet B radiation. Um, a lot of my work and my work with uh, my partner in practice, Ursula Kripa, and my research and teaching at Texas Tech University seeks to, to kind of reconceive of the borderland uh, in ways that, um, I guess, question the, the jurisdictional boundary, especially the national boundary, um, and to reconceive it in relationship to uh, forces of climate change and climate migration. So understanding the atmospheric shifts that actually impact bodies and the cities, the desert cities uh, throughout the borderland. Uh, the UV index, which we visualize here, I think is really indicative of, of one of these sort of vectors that crosses the boundary. Um, the UV index, as we know, sort of changes seasonally. This is basically the degree to which um, UV is irradiating different parts of the world uh, throughout the seasons. But also with climate change and the depleting, um, uh, the depletion of the ozone layer, there's actually a wider band of, of UV exposure um, north and south of the equator at different, uh, different times of the year. So the kind of UV border is something that's, uh, that's migrating across our, our international border as well. Uh, this is in tandem with some pretty significant demographic shifts. We've seen in the last few years that um, populations have been migrating uh, domestically within the U.S., primarily to western and southern states. And these are really um, collapsing on a few, uh, a few counties that are located sort of towards the southern extremity of the U.S., uh, counties that hold major cities like Los Angeles, Phoenix, Dallas, Houston, Miami. Um, and... We're interested in this because as, as populations from northern latitudes sort of migrate south, they, they put themselves at different and often increased risk for the kind of damaging effects of UV radiation. Um, populations that aren't necessarily used to this exposure are now in environments that, that increase the exposure. Um, in El Paso in particular, where I've lived and worked the last five years, um, we see a kind of typical distribution of, of where the population is coming from. So the, the kind of orange counties here are the sources that are moving in. Um, and it's quite spatially diverse. We get a little east-west movement, but we, we also see a large number of people moving in from, from northern latitudes, uh, from the northeast, the midwest, etc. Um, so the project really focuses on understanding how UV radiation in cities and UVB radiation um, the, the wavelength of UVB in particular contributes uh, to uh, poor health effects, including sunburn, skin damage, eye damage, uh, and immune system inhibition across a kind of range of demographics that are newly exposed, uh, both those migrating north and migrating south. Um, these photographs uh, from the researcher sort of show one of the major cruxes of, of the issue in that um, the UV spectrum of light is invisible to the naked eye, and UV sort of migrates across shadow conditions uh, in ways that aren't necessarily um, perceptible or um, sensible. So uh, the traditional photograph on, on the left and the UV photograph on the right uh, shows this kind of condition. Uh, atmospheric scattering of UV wavelengths also accelerates um, their, their kind of diffusion through environments, including in, in uh, desert environments like the ones that we live in, rendering bodies and shade uh, increasingly susceptible to damage. The borderland that surrounds El Paso and Ciudad Juarez is highly susceptible to this kind of scattering. Um, there's a high degree of airborne particulate in the atmosphere, both from anthropogenic sources um, like wood burning in, in Mexico and elsewhere, but also from windblown dust, from dry lake beds and other kind of geologic features throughout the Chihuahuan Desert, this enormous binational desert that we live in that surrounds us. Um, and it creates these really diffuse conditions of sunlight and radiation uh, throughout the landscape in our cities. Uh, you can see the kind of difference between the kind of visible spectrum and the infrared spectrum here. And the infrared has kind of eliminated the effects of scatter, so you can 
you can imagine how much scattering there is. Um, there are a number of emerging techniques uh, in order to capture the effects of radiation on populations. Um, I just show this as an example of an artist, Kara Phillips, who's, who's capturing the effects of invisible skin damage using a technique you might find at your dermatologist's office, um, using UV photography to kind of uh, reveal this underlying hidden condition of, of, kind of radiation as it's impacted the skin and um, left the skin susceptible to damage. Um, but we're exploring similar techniques to, to kind of image and also to imagine UV radiation at a number of different scales, from the scale of the territory uh, to the, the scale of the city uh, and the architectural scale as the, as the prize sort of mandates. Um, we're developing visualization and design tools to engage conditions of irradiated shade within the borderland. Uh, the national divide and other jurisdictional divides were also, by the way, between three different states, the state of New Mexico, Texas, and Chihuahua, um, limit the amount of corresponding and correlating data that is available in order to reach a kind of image of, of radiation within, uh, within the city. So we're using, um, as kind of a workaround, we're using remote sensing in order to bridge the state of divide uh, at the larger scale. Uh, but here we rely on, date, on available data that usually comes at pretty rough um, and coarse geospatial scales. So here we've developed a land, land use classification index in order to understand the location of urbanized development and emission sources that are contributing to the kind of atmospheric scatter uh, that's contributing to the irradiation of bodies in this environment. We've also generated this false color image in order to highlight natural shade um, the vegetation, as you may know, is, is shown in red in this kind of image, and the urbanization is sort of shown in the cyan. Um, and we also have our first measure of the impact of irradiation on the landscape. So here we extrapolated the satellite sensor data in order to produce a land surface temperature map. Uh, you can see the, the cool mountain peaks in blue sort of bisecting the top of the image and elsewhere. Uh, but also the, the kind of bright spots indicate the intense heat of the urban heat island in which populations are, are often seeking shade. Uh, zooming into the international borders, so you see El Paso sort of to the north of the curved river and Ciudad Juarez to the south. Uh, the international border especially suffers from what we're calling a shade deficit. Um, and this is even more apparent at the international crossings, like these two pedestrian bridges that connect the city, uh, where a kind of reduction in urban density, low building heights, and a scarce amount of street, street trees um, contribute to, to low measure of shade, despite the pretty incredibly high volume of pedestrian traffic of um, folks that are, that are crossing the bridges uh, and traveling through the international port of entry each day. Um, one of the major findings that we have so far from, from this scale is through closer inspection of our land surface temperature map, we can reveal a number of different hotspots that give us clues to locations where the, the kind of inequality index of shade um, is the most extreme. So we, we see throughout the map that um, sort of lower income neighborhoods are, are, are more poorly served uh, by public shade. Um, but here we also see intense heat around the pedestrian approaches to the international bridges, as well as neighborhoods in and around the border, which includes one of the poorest zip codes in the country. Um, so we're moving all of this from sensing into also a design environment where we begin to explore the applicability of different software workflows to pull, pull data into design software. So here we're working in Rhino with um, some, some already developed plugins um, like Grasshopper and Elk to integrate satellite data. Um, this workflow we've noticed sort of depends on a lot of factors. So it depends on things that are beyond our control. Uh, and we have to, have to uh, manage to find data that's available on a clear sky day. The processing um, is a bit cumbersome. It demands a high level of processing power and it's off, it leaves these sorts of images that are informative, but they're at a kind of like low coarse uh, spatial scale resulting in a planar graphic and atomized output. Um, so we're also developing a comprehensive building model of the borderland in order to more accurately physically compute the three-dimensional qualities of shade in the borderland. Um, here again, using a kind of uh, standard plugin with ladybug and butterfly shade analysis tools. 
uh, to identify areas with shade surpluses and shade deficits. Um, so here we have a look uh, just south of the International Crossing. Um, you can see the approach to the International Grid, International Bridge uh, as uh, the kind of vertical channel uh, towards the middle of the, of the image. Here we have just north of the border in El Paso, um, similarly kind of pedestrian plazas that are underserved. Um, and then we've identified an area actually near to um, the College of Architecture at Texas Tech El Paso um, that is sort of on the edge of downtown uh, where we're working with community partners to develop a prototype shade structure in a, in a particularly um, extreme kind of shade shade desert. Uh, so this is a spot that, that hosts a weekend market um, and captures a lot of um, a lot of different populations and we're working to, to sort of gain the approvals and, and work through the design to deploy something there. Um, but we also decided in, in addition to just kind of analyzing the city with some known tools, we quickly determined that we had to kind of develop our own and turn the approach to, to understanding the city sort of inside out in order to see the environment from the perspective of the radiation itself. Um, so we're, we were sort of inspired by these um, uh, like spherical projections that were able to capture um, an image of sky exposure. These are researchers working with uh, kind of big data in Google, uh, Google Street View to do this. Um, and we found in the research that actually the exposure within shade to particularly UVB radiation is directly correlated to the amount of sky that you can see from uh, under a shaded canopy. And so it was really important for us to, to develop a tool where we could um, under, under, understand, compute, um, and draw the kind of um, uh, the sky volume that, that is uh, visually accessible from any point in the city. And so we developed this kind of spherical projection algorithm uh, that takes any point in the city, scans the surrounding cityscape, and then masks the obstructions onto a sky dome. Um, that then give us not only a kind of graphic representation of the areas of potential vulnerability, but also a computable surface um, where we can understand not only like the percentage of sky cover in a different area, but also the, the relationship of very particular orientation vectors. Uh, we unroll this projection in a kind of panorama style drawing in order to better understand how the surrounding city already offers protection against UV exposure. And we can work in this environment sort of in real time with design proposals to see how interventions that we're proposing might additionally mask the sky dome as we work. Uh, the procedural algorithm continues to develop. I mean, we're always debugging and streamlining and, and testing it within different urban contexts, but we, we have sort of uh, future plans to develop it as a standalone plugin for other designers to use. Um, and we're interested in, in some of the uh, some of the results of the of the studies, including these kind of uh, catalogs of these masked sky domes, um, which is at once a kind of representation of uh, the visibility index from any point, but it's also a representation of what could be an optimized form for protecting against UVB. Uh, in a shaded condition. So we're planning to use this form as we develop uh, prototype shade structures that will serve a kind of didactic role in order to educate the public on the hidden dangers of shade. We're also experimenting with the technique as a different way to index the changing sky exposure and the radiation exposure values within the larger border flex context. context. Here we've deployed the algorithm at major intersections throughout the Metroplex where pedestrians are often traveling or kind of waiting for waiting for rides or waiting for public transit. Um, with this small sample, you can see that the borderlands is not only subject in general to a shade deficit, but it um, collects along the international boundary at kind of the middle of the image with darker orange indicating a higher percentage of exposed sky and therefore a larger surface area required for any protective structure. Um, and we can also sort of break this down into more um, tighter intervals so that we can see a progression of exposure as you would walk uh, down the street or on the sidewalk. So here's a test in El Paso moving toward the international boundary at the lower left of the image where you can see that the exposure steadily increases in anticipation of crossing the border. Um, so now we have this kind of borderland sky exposure catalog. Uh, we're calling this the kind of broken eggshell drawing. <laughs> 
maybe that's fitting for an incubator prize, I don't know, but um, this captures the various exposures and, and simultaneously signals the kind of desire for protection from any, any one of um, an infinite number of points within the borderland. Uh, from this catalog, we can now also begin to assess the impact of orientation um, and engage the science of UV uh, wavelength travel uh, exposure and scatter. So on the left, you see a kind of uh, maybe a more typical understanding of how um, the angle of incidence impacts uh, UVA uh, wavelength exposure, um, but we're developing uh, uh, sort of more nuanced understanding of how UVB works because it travels through scatter. It doesn't necessarily forward, follow the north-south logic. Um, it also occurs at different times of the day. So while UVA radiation from morning at the top to, to afternoon at night is rather predictable, um, UVB actually um, the, is primarily diffuse, but it also peaks just before and just after solar noon. So we're trying to identify the kind of design space of the project within the, these kind of time frames and work on exposures that might com combat, um, combat that. We also used our tools to analyze the districts around, surrounding the proposed project site and have reached out to various stakeholders and community partners to begin the design of the prototype structure. We're exploring ways to document the site from the perspective of radiation at increasingly high resolutions. Um, here, by creating a photographic grid using an infrared camera to capture the heat of the surfaces around the site at midday, um, we'll soon begin to use UVA and UVB sensors and microprocessors um, like Arduinos to, to provide feedback into our design environment and to better understand the UVB radiation scattering throughout the site, which depends on a lot of things, but among other things, on the reflectivity of neighboring surfaces and other factors that the modeling doesn't capture yet. Um, and we've begun to explore possible forms for a structure which will need to simultaneously cover a large area while selectively masking the sky exposure. And we see this just as the beginning of developing an ability to address um, the complicated biopolitics that are enmeshed in UV exposure and the provision of shade in the borderland. Uh, it's here that we increasingly see vulnerable populations exposed to high levels of UV radiation and an inability to adequately protect them from its damaging effects. We're discussing with project partners now how the shade structure might bring attention to some of these issues while also being replicable beyond the prototype stage. Thank you. Uh, this is, I also want to mention, this isn't just my work. This is with a team, uh, including my partner, Ursula Kripa, uh, and a team of research assistants. So uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Our final presentation of the afternoon is from Anahid Simitian and Bruno Nakaguma Gondo. They are studying changing agricultural uses of the Fertile Crescent and are developing a community-based seed inventory and experimental kitchen in the Baca Valley of Lebanon. They each received their AAD degree in 2015 and founded their office, Oficina El Aberta, which is based in Sao Paulo and Beirut. Welcome, Anahid and Bruno. Thank you, David. It's very good to be back in GSAP, even if it's just virtual. It's been very inspiring to see everyone's projects. So we want to thank GSAP for the opportunity to, car to carry out our research. Our project, Food Security in the Fertile Crescent, aims to highlight the intersection between climate change, food insecurity, and conflict. The project addresses this year's theme, climate change at the building scale, by first looking at a region where the challenges of climate change are palpably felt, yet overlooked due to geopolitical and economic turmoil. And second, by focusing on vulnerable communities in rural Lebanon and proposing social and programmatic approaches to mitigate the future imminent challenges of climate anomalies. 10,000 years ago, with the domestication of plants and animals, the first seeds of urban civilization were established in this region. Modern day Baghdad is the site of Mesopotamian civilization that first produced surplus food and consequently built, built and sustained cities. This perversely prompted a vicious cycle of conflicts, uh, a vicious cycle of conflicts for the acquisition and control of fertile lands caused by climate anomalies and food insecurity. 
A recent study reveals that the fall of the Akkadian Empire 4,000 years ago was an outcome of conflicts triggered from rapid aridification, which led to famine. Similarly, the civil war in Syria that began in 2011 has been linked to droughts caused by climate change. The Fertile Crescent is a geographical region that stretches from the Mediterranean Sea to the western borders of Iran, encompassing countries with freshwater resources and forming a green crescent that hugs the Syrian desert. Countries within the Fertile Crescent include parts of Egypt, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, Iraq, and Iran. With climate change, this region witnessed a severe drought between 2006 and 2009 recorded as the worst drought in the last 900 years. This drove 1.5 million, million Syrians to migrate from rural to urban territories. So this satellite image, which dates back to April 2008, highlights the effects of the drought on the vegetation. 2008 was also a pivotal year for global food insecurity, as it was the first time since the OPEC 1973 crisis that the sudden increase in oil prices triggered a global food crisis. As climate variability becomes more and more unpredictable and concerns for food security grow, the region is witnessing more regional civil conflicts and wars on natural resources. So although this map highlights the drought in the Fertile Crescent, it also highlights green areas in parts of Turkey and Iran. This recent disparity of access to water resources is largely due to dams built at the source of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers by Turkey, which has limited the flow of water to Syria and Iraq. In addition, Iran has diverted 42 rivers that previously flowed into Iraq. More than 50% of the region's water is sourced outside the region's territories, and 80% of the total water resources are used to irrigate agricultural lands. This has prompted disagreements between key regional, key regional states. These aerial photos of the Atatürk Dam in Turkey show um, how it, it was before its construction in 1983 and after it was built in 2002, showing how water is collected within a state's border, limiting the natural resources to surrounding countries. This is Qadisiya Reservoir in Iraq in 2006. Climate change and mismanagement of water resources has led to the loss of 144 cubic kilometers of fresh water between 2003 and 2009. And that's uh, roughly equivalent to the volume of the Dead Sea. Conflicts in their turn target the environment and its resources for food security. Here we can see ISIS burning crops in Iraq's Karashol mountains in May of last year. 2019 was marked by heavy rainfalls, the highest levels of precipitation since 1988. This caused floods putting almost 330,000 people at risk, but it also provided significant yields in crops with the highest wheat production rate since 1998, which were then targeted by militants. 5,100 hectares of agricultural lands in Iraq were burnt between the months of May and June 2019, which is during harvest season. Similarly, in Syria alone, 40,000 hectares of wheat and barley fields were subject to arson or were burned. Because it is important to note that while ISIS claimed credit for the fires in their online newsletter, some have blamed unusually warm weather and the fast drying of crops, while others have pointed fingers to pro-regime airstrikes. So as the world becomes warmer and resources scarcer, the Fertile Crescent is but a reflection of the future global reality. So how can we break this vicious cycle of climate change, food insecurity, and conflict in the region and prevent it from spreading? One proposed solution is the regeneration of crop wild relatives, or CWR, in the Fertile Crescent. These are crops prior to being domesticated, which, you know, they're crops, they're the wild relatives of the crop that we consume. Um, and because they are wild, they are resilient to aridity, salinity, droughts, pests, and extreme weather conditions. So they are the future of our food security. We were introduced to CWR through this paper titled Setting Conservation Priorities for Crop Wild Relatives in the Fertile Crescent. A research, ca a research carried out by the Plant Genetics Department at the University of Birmingham in, co in collaboration with ICARDA the International Center for Agricultural Research in Dry Areas. 
So the study finds a total of 21,000 native varieties and recognizes 835 varieties to have high socioeconomic value. It also recognizes this region for having the highest concentration of CWR per unit area with 84 global priority, priority varieties for, food, for the future of food security in every 25 square kilometer. So one way to ensure that CWR adapt to the future climate is through in-situ conservation. So the planting of the species to adapt to the changing weather and soil conditions. The image here is of a wild relative of the pea or bean family that grows as wildflowers in the region. This was collected by Dr. Nigel Maxted in Syria in 2002. Dr. Maxted is one of the co-authors of the research paper who's also the chairperson in plant genetic conservation at the University of Birmingham and an avid collector of CWR. We contacted Dr. Maxted and he was very enthusiastic to find architects in interested in his research. And he put us in contact with plant geneticist Dr. Magda Kharat and Juzur Lebanon, an NGO in Lebanon that focuses on reforestation, agrobiodiversity, and conservation of CWR. Their most recent project focuses on, on Raisel Lebanon. It's a village in agrarian town near the Syrian border that has high agrobiodiversity but is still recovering from the aftermath of conflict. So looking at a map of targeted agrarian communities in the Fertile Crescent, the region has witnessed a 40% decrease in agricultural production, preventing countries in conflict to attain food security. The damage to fields has had devastating effects on agricultural outputs, further impoverishing rural communities and contributing to rural to urban exodus. Highlighted in this map is the agrarian town of Arsel in Lebanon, which fell victim to the regional conflicts and where our project will be lo located and developed in collaboration with Juzur Lebanon and the local farming co-op. So between 2014 and 2017, rogue militant groups, including ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra, terrorized Arsel before being forced to fully retreat back into Syria leaving behind 2,000 landmines and other DIY explosives on agricultural lands. So our sale has an estimated population of 40,000 Lebanese locals and 100,000 Syrian refugees, so more than twice as many. 85% of the locals are landowners, having a total area of 465 square kilometers of lands planted with approximately 2 million local fruit trees that are resilient to droughts, such as cherries, apricots, apples, grapes, and 500-year-old pear trees. So all these lands were destroyed uh, or were inaccessible during the conflict. Our sales farmers co-op have since reached out to Juzul Lebanon to help restore their agri agricultural lands, establish new nurseries to expand their production, and offer Syrian refugees employment opportunities, as well as have workshops on sustainable farming. In January, we met with the farming, farming co-op's representatives, Ahmad Fiti and Nimr, who walked us through the site. They were eager to inform us about the biodiversity of their village, such as the 200 varieties of wild almonds, and recounting what ISIS had destroyed. They further explained how the militants burned a community facility to the ground. Highlighted here is one of the site options that was donated by Nimr, one of the local farmers we met. It has access to a main road, convenient to transportation and logistics. It has a relatively flat topography and is in close proximity to the refugee camps and the local community. The site did not show any traces of war, but when seen from above, is surrounded by homes, refugee camps, and agricultural lands. With their stories in mind, we strove to design a community center that brings the locals and refugees together through the growing of CWR. The rural community center comprises of the CWR nursery that includes a greenhouse for seedlings and a support facility, which includes a workshop space to learn about the collection and conservation of CWR, a kitchen to experiment with wild crops, and a reception that also houses a store for local produce. All programs stand on a platform that can flexibly accommodate for community-based activities between locals and refugees. It addresses sustainability through its orientation that utilizes passive solar design. The greenhouses can sustainably recreate ideal weather conditions for seed germination and continuous production of high-quality CWR seedlings throughout the year. 
This section perspective shows how the building uses geothermal weather control. The geothermal ground to air heat transfer keeps the space warm in winter and cool in summer, decreasing operation costs by 75 to 90%. This allows farmers to focus on the seedlings rather than the building maintenance costs. In addition, it has fully insulated reflective galvanized steel northern wall that, ma that maximizes natural sunlight and protects seedlings from harsh northern winds. Its recyclable galvanized steel frame structure has a facade of 16 millimeter triple wall polycarbonate that is durable and has high light transmittance. The system allows the crop wide relative nursery to be combined with cultivation methods such as aquaponics to efficiently manage water and other resources. The building addresses climate change by bringing vulnerable farmers and displaced communities together in a space dedicated to learning and growing local crop wild relatives, crops with high socioeconomic value and, and the future of food security. It simultaneously addresses climate change through the building construction system that symbiotically utilizes earth, while efficiency is what drove us to choose materials that can perform reliably, are durable, and can be reassembled or recycled in the future. The building will be an experimental prototype that would allow us to learn from user experience and improve or change its construction methods for future expansions throughout the Fertile Crescent. On the whole, the project is an ar architectural intervention as a response to mitigate climate change by giving nature and crop wild relatives a safe space to recover and providing neglected agrarian communities with a platform to reappropriate and revitalize their economic standing within the current regional landscape. Great, thank you for that um, presentation and thank you um, to all of the GSAP Incubator Prize winners. I mean, this was really fascinating and inspiring work. Um, I think it was fittingly serious, you know, for the, for the topic at hand. Um, and also fittingly diverse. I mean, I think there were, a, you know, a, a wide range of approaches and um, topics and techniques that, that, that people used, um, you know, from, uh, uh, but, but actually I'd like to just make a couple of quick observations about some overlaps, you know, not entire overlaps, but overlaps of, you know, theme or technique. So, it was interesting to hear biodiversity come up, you know, with Dan and Adam. It was uh, interesting to hear um, an emphasis on the rural with Dan and Eugenia. Um, hempcrete and materials and different other material approaches was common to Greta and Eugenia and Adam. Um, computational analysis was uh, part of, of the work of um, Adam and Stephen and Dan. Um, social equality was part of the work of Eugenia and Stephen and Anna Heed and Bruno. Um, Community-based engagement and design was part of the work of Eugenia and Anna Heed and Bruno. Anyway, there are a lot of ways of, you know, we could make it some kind of crazy Venn diagram of the overlapping. And I think that's, um, you know, in part what we had in mind for this, um, you know, this loose association of projects, you know, that are all exploring, um, you know, one common theme, but in different ways. Um, so I, I know we're going to run out of time soon. I want to ask uh, one or two questions and then um, we'll see if we have time as well for any questions from the room uh, at, at, in Avery. Um, one of the things that's on my mind is um, the topic of climate commitments and you know, GSAP is hosting another event later this semester called Climate Commitments, um, which will bring together a range of architecture firms, but also institutions and, you know, cities, but also architectural institutions um, and, and also academic centers. And all of these different kinds of things, the firms, the institutions, the academics um, have uh, pledged to transform their work in the context of climate change generally in the next 10 years. I mean, think of this in the, in, in the vein of the you know, Paris Agreement. It's like, what, what are different nations committing to by 2030? What are different firms committing to? What are you know, cities or associations of architects committing to academics? What are they committing to? Um, so I wanted to ask all of you as you know, out there in the world doing these exciting things you know, all over the globe, 
is this kind of pledging on on your radar? And if so, um, given your your work on these incubator prize projects, uh, but also your broader practices, I wonder if there are any um, commitments that you might have challenged yourself to make or that you think um, you might challenge others to make as well, you know, in the context of the things you're exploring. Like we could almost do an exercise of just translating your each of your theses into a pledge, right? A, a pledge for yourself and then a kind of call to action for others to do the same. But I wonder if you're thinking about that or if or if you even want to question that approach. So anyone who has a, a comment on that, I think we'd be excited to hear your response. I'm happy to respond just because one of our most complicated um, and all of these institutions, like one of the most complicated issues is funding and where you get your funding and who you accept funding from. And I think over the course of our work, it's been really hard to find like clean money. Um, and what is ethical money? Like, is that, um, is that out there? I think it's kind of easy to identify <clears throat> what's not ethical. Um, like, you know, if you're, whatever, if you're involved in child labor weapons, you know, there's certain like big bad um, money makers that, but, but it's much more complicated when you think about public funding. And if you're going after public funding, where does our public funding come from? And we've been challenged basically on every, every category of funding that we've proposed, we've gotten pushback. Um, so I'd love to hear what other people I have no solutions, just kind of problematizing that. And that's always kind of the elephant in the room. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm curious to hear others, but just quickly, I have, have, have you pledged not to take any money related to fossil fuels? I, I mean, I think you were kind of alluding to that earlier, but. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, so what, what we're doing is kind of making those determinations like who do we not accept money from as we're doing that in our process i think we're finding the list uh the list can go on and on you cannot you know the, the and where you draw those lines is um has been really tricky for us it's really easy to say we won't take money from fossil fuel companies directly but there's for every one fossil fuel company there's 10,000 that profit kind of directly from the fossil fuel industry. So drawing those lines yeah. has been really challenging. Yep, that makes sense. I, I just thought I'd say that I, I noticed um, a couple of months ago that Snuheta, the architecture firm, pledged to um, uh, stop, I think they pledged to um, only build um, carbon neutral buildings going forward and they had an idea um, which was largely based in energy production actually through photovoltaics um, and it's been something that I think we've seen architecture firms all over the world begin to do in different ways um, commit to only um, build with um, heavy timber for instance um, commit to certain materials and I think we've been incredibly inspired by the, the idea to say of saying no. Um, it, it's particularly difficult for a small firm as you search out work um, to but I, but I think but I think we're generating the idea that making a commitment um, to work on sustainable buildings, making a commitment to you know possibly only working on passive buildings, um, can actually be one way to to find more clients, um, and we're kind of working actually on on now finding our own clients instead of responding to market demands. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I, I think actually the Snowheda one might have been carbon negative buildings by a certain year, which is a great you know category for using hempcrete. You know, it's a great alliance. Any any other thoughts? I think I'll, I'll just add, um, I haven't thought ex explicitly about this in my project, but I can see um, a number of, of metrics that could be developed in order to 
uh, kind of leverage or advocate for something like uh, like UV equity or shade equity. And I, I think it'd be interesting across the range of projects. We have uh, kind of inherited a system of metrics, including carbon neutral slash negative and, and energy efficiency and, and whatnot. Um, and I think it's also on us to develop the, the, the meaningful metrics that we should measure what's important and not make important what we can measure. Um, so while we're achieving, I think while we're building on uh, making pledges of the kind of known uh, system of sustainable resilient solutions, we also need to sort of uh, contribute other ways to evaluate and other ways to, to sort of advocate for, for performance or equity, whatever we're after. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really great way to frame it. You know, to to um, design the metrics. You know, the the metrics themselves could be an act of design. So, um, and I think you put it really uh, articulately. Um, I want to, you know, if if other people have r reflections on that, you know, they can jump in. But I want to throw one more question out there before we uh, run out of time, and that is, um, how do you draw or model climate. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of, you know, really compelling images and material from all of you today. And I, I just wonder if, you know, do we need a, do we need new types of drawings for this new context? And because I think these projects could make the case for that, right? We're, we're seeing something a little different than we typically see in an architectural project. Yeah, I, I just want to go back to the first question. Um, yeah, good. Can, that I think geography influences one's ability to commit because we're working in Brazil and Lebanon, both are developing countries. And so our clients really don't care about climate change because it's not something that they can grasp. You know, of course it's happening. Everyone agrees, but it's not an imminent threat as opposed to other imminent threats that they can, everything, you know. Um, but how do you draw or scale climate change? Um, we were looking at these, you know, the whole region um, with the Fertile Crescent. But also we found a lot of interesting images, which we didn't put because, you know, we had, we were constrained at the time, of seeds and how the seed itself changes with climate change and adapts to heat or gets resilient to. So it's this huge scale. And I don't know how as architects we can learn from that or you know, have the tools to learn from biology itself and how it's adaptable and how um, with the tools that we use, whether they're adaptable or not. Just, just a thought. Yeah. That's really interesting. I think one of, one of the things that um, we come across in our work a lot is, uh, yeah, this representational challenge of climate, especially since climate is so um, statistically based uh, and it tends to sort of manifest itself at a scale that's totally in conflict with uh, what we anticipate architectural resolution or material resolution might be. And so we're, um, I, don't, I don't know that our goal is to represent climate, uh, but it's, it's something about deciding on a representational strategy that, in which you can engage something like, uh, for lack of a better term, microclimate or something like this, right? That by, by sort of turning, turning climate into a kind of hyper-local condition and using sensing or using uh, sort of point-by-point -point analysis instead of sort of territorial statistical analysis in order to get a handle on it, I think we, we we find that we're able to, to sort of gain some sort of agency over it. Um, but we might be turning a blind eye to climate with, with the big C <laughs> by, by privileging the kind of micro. I, I think there's one really obvious thing that, that drawing or maybe computer modeling can do. We were looking a lot specifically at embodied energy and there is a lot of work being done right now to try and measure the embodied energy of different materials and buildings and um, perform calculated totals of, of buildings. And I, I can imagine that 
um, you know, with the Brevet and the new softwares that we're using to develop new buildings, that that could be integrated um, into our, our drawing and, and, you know, the architecture before the before construction. I would um, add, you know, this is less related to, let's say, the, the kind of computational performance an aspect of our work, but um, one of the the, the, the um, types of drawings that have been like really effective in let's say galvanizing awareness or support of, for our project over the years has been um, these kind of speculative drawings from the drawn from the perspective of uh, non-human animals, um, which in, in, with our students, we call them the fish eye view, like kind of underwater view of these landscapes. Um, at a large scale, um, and we found um, that with in in meeting with like community groups or, or the community education initiatives that we run in Oakland um, or potential funders, um, oftentimes um, the people uh, resonate more with the the kind of interests of animals um, as a way to think about climate rather than the kind of human impacts, um, which is is bizarre and fascinating. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, it's it, it does, and I think that resonates a little bit with what Stephen was saying. That you know, there's there's this range of things. You know, from what Greta's describing, that like the metrics that are now available, compatible with our you know existing digital tools, and that can maybe help us design in new ways. Um, to the the things that are still important that are not just the easy metrics or this typical metrics, you know, that could include the features of imagination, like you're describing, Adam, and helping people to see things in a new way, which architectural drawings have always, you know, uh, strives to do. I actually did want to um, engage in this, each of the speakers in one question, just sort of informing our thinking, David and I working on this climate um, commitments conference, as we discussed, um, or as he mentioned already, one of the things that um, we're really considering with that, in addition to what's going on in practice and what's going on with institutions that are supporting um, these efforts of climate change, is um, to think about how our curriculum is changing. Um, and with the opportunity of having um, this group of distinguished alumni, all of you having graduated roughly within the past dec or you know decade, but um, also being pretty far afield from your experiences at the schools is, um, and also some of you having taught, could you um, sort of give us a sense of like, you know, maybe just like one idea of uh, something that you, a skill that you're using now that um, you think could lend itself well to a, a curricula towards a sort of climate urgent, um, course and, and what that might be. Um, I think that's something that feedback from people who have been here is something that uh, is really critical to um, to this conversation as it develops here at the school. I'm, um, yeah, I think that's a great question um, and an important one. And I can talk a little bit about um, the kind of pedagogical base, you know, roots of the, of the Boyne Ecologies Project, which began you know, as I mentioned, in a kind of speculative setting um, in an in architecture school with architecture students, thinking about what a float, floating architecture could look like. Um, I would say the two things that, that have been critical to kind of uh, feed the project, um, one has been the interdisciplinary aspect um, that from the beginning, we've been working with our partners at Moss Landing Labs, um, you know, since 2014 um, and, and in a, it, it's hard to kind of forge a, a, a collaborative partnership in a meaningful way, um, especially since they're like three hours away. But, um, you know, bringing them to the studio, having bringing our students to their lab, um, making sure that there's kind of regular interactions has, has helped kind of produce this interesting feedback where the students um, inspire the ecologists to kind of think about their own discipline in a different way largely through drawings. Um, and the ecologists, of course, inspire the students to think about architecture in a different way. Um, so I think that's been one super important um, aspect. The other one, which I think is, is kind of present in all these projects, 
um, is to prototype um, and to to make tests and experiments and to put them out in the world. Um, and you know, we I think it's obvious, but um, without doing that, without kind of seeing what's possible, um, the, a lot of this work kind of remains in an in an academic realm. I would say briefly a focus on regionalism and bioregionalism and moving outside of just, um, I mean, I think that's a crisis in the field that we call it urban planning and we continue to call it urban planning where cities don't exist in isolation at all in any way. Um, and I think um, just a, like a, a, a deeper understanding of um, not just like your regional hinterlands, but but all the ways in which global resources make New York, New York and make a city a city. I wonder too if there's um, if there are opportunities to reconsider uh, what what credentials are achieved with that sort of education that um, like there's something about the certification processes and the licensing requirements for architects and planners and lead certification and all of these things to sort of filter through different professional um, or academic settings, but there's not, there's not really a, like a credentialing system that leverages a kind of like architectural education in tandem with a, uh, with a climate focus or with a sustainability focus. Like there's no, there's no word for that, that isn't a climate scientist and isn't an, isn't an architect. And I wonder, uh, beyond the, the sort of step-by-step -step pedagogy, um, what what other degrees or what other credentials we could imagine that would give somebody a seat at the table? Because what we're asking, what we're asking of people educated in this way is to to be able to affect policy, um, and you would you would approach that differently if you're approaching that table as an as an architect who just happens to you know know everything about material science or climate science versus um, a credentialed professional in some other some other discipline. So I think there's there's a kind of climate design credential that, that needs to be considered. Yeah, and maybe with that, um, in a way, that's that's a pretty radical call to action um, to reimagine um, the the degree. I mean, maybe just to wrap up, I'll I'll let you you remote people know what I, maybe this has gotten to you in one way or another, but. Along those lines, um, Columbia as a university has um, started to investigate what it would mean to have a climate school, you know, like there's a school of architecture, school of public health, climate school. And um, the, the new director of the Earth Institute, Alex Halliday, has been going around and talking to all the different schools, existing schools and departments about this. And there seems to be a certain momentum. and. Um, so I, I, I think while it's a kind of radical idea about a new new degree, um, the idea of a seat around the table, the idea of like, do we need a radical transformation to address the context that's already radical um, is I think a, a really relevant question and maybe a good, a good kind of provocation to leave us all uh, mulling over. I definitely want to thank all of the presenters. From my perspective, the event went went very well, but we welcome anyone's, you know, feedback on this uh, video conference format. Um, and I I think um, you guys uh, who who all presented in the initial round of recipients of the GSAP Incubator Prize have set the bar very high for future. Um, of, of prize winners and for the current students you've pointed out a, a range of different you know really exciting paths um, that could be explored and thank you all for your great work on behalf of everyone here in avery thank you guys all so much for um for being here with us for the time that you took to test for one of the smoothest calls i've ever been on um in, uh, in public which was uh, really amazing. So um, thank you everyone for your participation. We really appreciate it.